Welcome back, mercenaries, solos, and netrunners. I hope your time pillaging in between your underworld contracts thus far has been a fruitful affair. As we continue to edge closer to our day of arrival within Night City, I deeply hope these reports continue to be useful to you, as that day is quick to arrive. You should find yourself better prepared to face any potential threats. In today's report, we will touch upon Arasaka's magnificent rival, the US-backed paramilitary megacorporation of Militech. Now, Militech's story began in 1998, a familiar time of conflict and economic struggle for many megacorporations, a time in which our world was ongoing a period of great revival through absolute capitalist measures. The world's economy, especially that of the U.S., had suffered the Great Collapse of 94, forcing the U.S. dollar to retreat from its leadership position on the world's economic stage, opening the door for its successive currency, the euro dollar. During this time, the world's center of power would also shift to Europe, leaving a United States in an unfamiliar position, lacking its previous economic stranglehold on the world with a failing imperialist regime. In this whirlwind, the U.S. sought to modernize its weapon systems. The Joint Chiefs aligned in their fear that the Soviet Union, or even European-backed rebels, would descend upon their hemisphere of control in South America. Militech's claim to fame and financial liberation would be found in a contract proposal for the United States' new weapon platform, replacing the now long-serviced and veteran weapons platform of the M16A1 and its modicum improvement, the M16A2. Initially introduced in 1964 as a mobile automatic rifle carrying a NATO standardized 5.56 millimeter round, the M16 was the workhorse of the United States military. It saw conflict in over 50 countries across the globe, and it boasted almost 8 million units produced and operated in its product population. As the U.S. was finalizing its contractually obligated bidding process and trial process for a new weapons platform, the collapse of 94 would occur, eliminating any opportunity for the U.S. to utilize a competitive, a reliable, a sturdy weapons platform that Militech had aimed to create on their behalf. A General Donald Lundy, member of the U.S. Joint Chiefs, actively fought with politicians in Congress, citing the unforeseen human impact of choosing a cheaper weapon system in an effort to save short-term taxpayer dollars. Unheard and ultimately ignored, Lundy would find his soldiers being paired with a more affordable, less reliable weapon systems in FN SAP. Similar to a L-85, the United Kingdom's military forces would utilize. Broken and disillusioned by Congress's inability to see past short-term challenges and gross ineptitude by the political elite, Donald Lundy would wander to a position within the corporate circles of Militech. With a newly infused mission, Lundy would transform Militech's arms production, specifically aiming to win over the United States military armament efforts by 2004. This came just after the Second South American Conflict, a war in which the U.S. had suffered tremendous casualties due in part to their decision to utilize a weapon system platform that was supremely unreliable. Finally, to Lundy's surprise, the U.S. politicians and Joint Chiefs executed their exit clause on the SAP contract and began working with Militech's Ronin Light Assault Rifle, a first in a series of successes for Militech, and its now net new CEO, Donald Lundy. As Donald left the Pentagon and his position as a Joint Chief of one of the world's most influential armies, he aimed to utilize his considerable expertise and patriotism within the corporate sales arm of Militech. Donald had hoped 
to form a partnership with Militech and the United States would be able to provide the U.S. military an affordable and effective military armament from rifle to warship. But Militech had envisioned a much different objective for Donald. The board of directors had hoped Donald's union with the company would enable more opportunity to open discussion on deal structures with not only the U.S. government, but governments around the world, using Donald's considerable prestige as a claim to enforce the company's effective and affordable standards. Donald, not to be considered naive to the capitalist and revenue-focused direction of the now-growing megacorporation strived to consolidate his power within the company. While Donald held considerable bounty of Militech stock, he was still in a position to be ousted by the board as he did not own the position of chairman. Nor did he and the current chairman see eye to eye in terms of business or revenue strategy. Lundy would perpetually be in a struggle of internal politics as he continued to deliver successful strategic business relations through his previous relationship with the U.S. government. Of course, for Donald, his power and influence was set to change during the onset of the Fourth Corporate War. The Fourth Corporate War seems to touch almost every report we've created at this point. And to be frank, this event is the reason Night City is as independent, as entrenched into its position today. Between two military corporations of Arasaka and Militech was a city set to become their battleground, our future home of Night City. Donald and Militech found themselves at odds with Arasaka, but business avenue first, an opportunity to test new armaments second. Militech used the corporate contract against Arasaka as an opportunity, largely backed by media dollar and PR spend, to showcase an advantage of innovation that the American company held over their Japanese back and somewhat archaic Arasaka. Unlike Arasaka, who viewed the war as a philosophical battle and an extension of World War II, Militech approached warfare with opportunity and innovation, operating in a fashion designed not only to protect their clientele, but also to disrupt as much Arasaka market share as possible. Much of the strategy implemented was formulated and executed with military precision. It likely benefit of having a former Joint Chief as now acting CEO. Eventually, as you may well know, this story would end with the decimation of Night City and its surrounding metropolitan area, when a Militech strike team detonated a suitcase nuclear bomb within the Arasaka Tower. This event was publicly blamed on Arasaka by the U.S. government and then acting leader President Crash, but Donald the board of Militech and the U.S. shadow government utilized the truth to apply a certain pressure, a certain blackmail. After these events in Night City, the U.S. government moved to nationalize the Militech military armament, in part to strengthen the now former world superpower and to prevent another rogue megacorporation from attempting another action so brazen in similarity. In today's age, Militech still continues to have closely aligned ties with the U.S. government, while still producing and supplying effective military arms across the globe. They are, without a doubt, one of the world's largest arms suppliers and defense contractors, with the ability to deploy resources anywhere across the world, funneling strategy via regional offices everywhere. You may even have the chance to encounter Militech when you enter Night City, as they reportedly have an operational office somewhere inside. But as you can imagine, entering or pillaging the information or military bounties within would not be a simple feat. But for you, perhaps that is a part of your ethos, let's call it. It's what drives you. What makes you chase the next high, that impossible challenge made probable solely by your will? 
The time approaches when we will have a chance to test some of those arrogances, mercenaries, and solos. Just stay alive until then. I can't wait to write the next report about your legacy.